Hi, everyone. Welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you. It's a new week, and we are continuing with our discussion towards the ICA November 2020 examination. And most importantly, we're going to be focusing on key issues this week and discussing some key things that we need to do in order for you to prepare well for your examination. But most importantly, you know that we have less than four weeks to go for the examination starting on 30th of November 2020. I see some of you guys already joining the stream. You are welcome to the stream. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join the stream. That way we get more engagement on the stream and YouTube will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible and assist a lot of students as we gear towards the ICA November 2020 examination. And today we want to focus on one of the critical topics in uh, corporate reporting or strategic business reporting, as well as financial reporting, and that is consolidated financial statements. I'm excited about this topic a lot because it is one of the topics that are very interesting, very technical, but also has a couple of easy marks that you can pick up in order for you to pass the examination. So I see some of you guys joining. Welcome to the stream. Uh, smash the like button when you join. Uh, that way we get more engagement of the video and I see some comments coming in here. Uh, Khadija Mensa, you are welcome to the stream. Gabriel Kogu, you are welcome to the stream. Um, Zayed Minhas, I see you. Uh, Samad Gaid said, good evening. Best wishes from India. All right, good evening. Best wishes to you as well. Um, Ebenezer Sai, I see you on the stream. You are welcome. When you join, smash the like button on the video page. If it is not blue, come on, man. Make it blue. That way we get more engagement on the video so we can reach as many students as possible. So consolidated financial statement. This is, I'm going to cover this for both corporate reporting as well as financial reporting because I'm going to uh, just use one stone to be able to kill the two birds. So when I'm discussing what the corporate reporting aspect is, if you're doing financial reporting, you just make sure that you stay alert and then know the limit of it. And I'm going to guide you on all of that in that case. So, hey, I see some of you. Thank you very much for the thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. I see a comment from uh, Adolphus is from uh, Liberia. Okay, Adolphus, you are welcome to the stream. Jeremy said, good evening, sir. It's good to be here again, all the way from Liberia. Shout outs to my Liberians. I mean, uh, we see that, that we have a lot of people as well coming in from Liberia, and I hope that you are finding a lot of value on the channel as we continue with our discussion towards the ICAD November 2020 examination. Um, Kwame, Obrimpon, e Japan. Obrimpon, I hope you are doing well. I don't know if it is the Obrimpon. I know, though, but hey, Obrimpon, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, it's Kwame, Obrimpon, e Japan is the one. So I hope you're doing well, and I hope that all is well with you. So let's get straight up into our discussion for the day. Not wasting any time at all. Let's go straight up into the discussion. Now, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, in the comment box for me. I will be replying to all of your questions, and if there are any things you would want me to cover as we prepare for the uh, examination, remember our executive revision masterclass is actually commencing today's week, and uh, it's going to be a way that we are going to uh, go through a couple of things in the next three weeks, intensive uh, period, three weeks, where we're going to be going through a lot of things, practicing a lot of questions, and how you can position yourself strategically to pass the examination. And you can see the details scrolling below the screen. And it's 325 dollars it is per paper. If it is something that you are interested in, you can call or WhatsApp 050-114-9296, 050-114-9296. But let me issue this. If you are lazy, you cannot join my executive revision masterclass because we're going to demand a lot from you. You're going to do a lot of work. You're going to go do a lot of uh, uh, go through a lot of things in order for you to be mentally prepared, psychologically psyched up, and emotionally stable so you can actually pass the examination. So whatever details you want about our executive revision masterclass, you can call or WhatsApp. 050-114-9296, 050-114-9296, and then 
that details or those details will be sent to you. Uche Ijo, who said hi, Ishira. Hello, Uche. I hope you're doing well. Abu Hasmin from Tanzania. All right, Abu Hasmin. I hope you're doing well. Samad Gates said your videos helping me. I am recommending your channel to my friends in India. Thank you very much, uh, Samad Gates. Thank you very much. We want more people to be able to get access to the channel. We have a lot of content on the channel already, and students can use it to help them to prepare for the examination. So thank you very much, Samad Gate, for recommending my channel and also sharing it with your friends. We hope that they will also find value the way you are finding value on the channel. Mavis Man said, hello. Hi, Mavis. Uche said, uh, can you help me to prepare a lecture on strategic clock module. Okay. Can you help me uh, prepare a lecture on strategic clock model? Yep. I don't know if we have lectures on that. Uche, you can send me a message on WhatsApp uh, later on after the class, and then we can see how we will go with that. Okay, Uche. Uh, James Nyanko said, hi. Hello, James. I hope you're doing well. We have some people coming in from Facebook. Yeah, Facebook, let's hear from you as well in the comment box, and I'll be replying to all of them in that case. So let's go consolidated financial statements. Consolidated financial statements. Consolidated financial statements. Now, let me say, say this of the bed. Um, before you go through or we continue with our discussion, like I keep on telling you guys, when you are writing the financial reporting or the corporate reporting exams, consolidated financial statement is a question you don't want to answer first. Like I tell you all the time in my discussions, you don't want to answer consolidated financial statements first. I know there are a lot of you writing corporate reporting, financial reporting, and your heart is beeping literally. And when you get to the exam hall, something is going to strike you in your brains and you are going to start with consolidated financial statement. But let me tell you, do not start with consolidated financial statements in the exam hall, number one. Number two, make sure, make sure that you attempt questions that you can do first, before coming to this place. That is why I recommend that you go to question five. That is the normal slam theory area on ethics, conceptual framework, regulatory framework. And if the examiner is excited, some standards will be there. Then you can come to question four, evaluation of financial statements or interpretation of financial statements. If you're a good student and you are learning under my membership, ratios are one of the areas that you're going to be mastering in that case. I did a two-part lecture on this already on the channel, so you can check it up on the channel and watch that video. You want to make sure you're strong there. Then standards. Question two. Standards. You're going to have corporate reporting 25 marks on standards, financial reporting 20 marks on standards. So you're going to make sure you build your muscles a lot on the standards. Why is that important? Because if you are strong in the standards, financial reporting, you will be able to do the single entity financial statement question comfortably. So that before you come to consolidated financial statements, you just do the workings and then stop work. And from the workings, you can get maps in that case. For those of you who you jump and go and put pro forma down, we don't mark pro forma. Okay? So for those of you who jump and go and put pro forma down, Consolidated statement of financial position. Then they go and put property plans and equipment. Then they will bring the parent figure, the subsidiary figure. Then they will jump inventory, the parent figure, the subsidiary figure. Then they will jump trade receivables, the parent figure, the subsidiary figure. You realize that I'm not closing the bracket because there has to be what? Adjustment. The examiner doesn't mark what you put here. It is the final figure on the group that is going to be marked. So for those of you who jump in the exam hall and you are going to go and put a pro forma down thinking you will get anything for that, I'm sorry, you're going to screw yourself up. So that is what I want you to do in relation to that. Go to question five, write out those theories and run away from there. 
Come to question four, come and do the interpretation of financial statements or evaluation of financial statement. Come to question two, do the standards, go to question th four, uh, question three, do the single entity financial statement. Then you're going to prepare yourself, do the necessary workings and the consolidated financial statement. Listen to this very well. I have shared with you the pass rate for financial reporting and corporate reporting. Yes. Students are able to do corporate uh, consolidated financial statement in the exam hall, but the students who fail the exam, numerous. Why? Because when you touch the consolidated financial statement, you're going to spend more than the time required. Before you realize, one hour, one, in, one hour, ten minutes, and you are still on consolidated financial statement. That is where you start failing. That is where you start panicking. That is where you start screaming. And that is where everything else begins to freeze in your brain. And you can't even think to calculate ratios. You can't even think to deal with the standards. So to avoid any unnecessary pressure, position yourself strategically and go to question five, come to question four, go to question two, come to question three. Then you say goodbye on the consolidated financial statement. That is what I want you to do, and that is what you have to do if you really want to sail through easily and pass the examination at the end of the day. We good? So that was just by the way. So let's go consolidated financial statements. Now, why consolidated uh, financial statements? Why, why is this subject very important to us at this level? The reason is that businesses want to expand and grow. And in an attempt for businesses to expand and grow, there is what we call organic expansion or organic growth. This is where the business will start its own organization from scratch and then goes away. But then the fastest way to be able to expand and grow is to acquire an already existing business so that it can leverage on the processes they already have, leverage on everything they've built already, the customer list, the goodwill, everything, boom, then you'll be able to skyrocket and grow quickly. It is for this reason why companies go out of their way to acquire other companies in relation to that. Like how Facebook acquired uh, Instagram, Facebook acquired WhatsApp, and other big various forms of acquisitions happening even uh, uh, around the world in relation to that. So when a business wants to expand, boom, it is going to be able to what? Expand through acquisition. And that is very simple in that case. So when the business is expanding, then the predator firm, that is the acquirer, is going to find a target firm and tries to acquire them. And the business valuation comes in, we value the business, and at the end of the day, boom, we acquire the business. So when we acquire the business, what happens is that the parent company, that is the company controlling more other entities, and then the subsidiary, which is an entity controlled by another entity, he is going to, they will prepare their financial statement, we will prepare our financial statement. But at the end of the day, shareholders will want to look out for and see, uh, what is the group position? How much profit did we make from all the businesses? Yeah, we know this guy made this, this guy made that, but on an, in a nutshell, how much profits did we make? What is our total asset as a group? So that is where we combine the two financial statements as though it is a single entity. So that is the idea about consolidated financial statement. Combination of the parents and its subsidiaries' uh, investments into a single financial statement as though it is a single entity in relation to that. So that is the idea about the consolidated financial statements. But before I get excited and go into a number of issues there, there are a couple of standards that we're going to be paying close attention to in here as we build our knowledge. The first one is IAS 28, Investment in Associates and Joint Venture Arrangements. Um, IAS 27, Separate and Consolidated financial statement, IFRS 3, business combination, uh, IAS 24, related party disclosures, and then also the issue in relation to IFRS 10 will also be touched on. So these are a couple of standards that we're going to be cruising through as we discuss this particular 
topic or subject in relation to that. So let's start with some KG2 definitions, all right? We're going to be using a couple of terminologies throughout. So let's start with some KG2 definitions. You know these things already. So a parent, okay, a subsidiary, you're going to hear the word control as well in that case. So what is a parent entity? In a simple language, we say that this is an entity that has one or more subsidiary. A parent is an entity that has more than one or one or more subsidiaries. So what is a subsidiary? Look at what I wrote, subsequent. Can you imagine that? Subsidiary. So when we say a firm is a subsidiary, what do we mean? A subsidiary is an entity that is controlled by another entity known as the parent, known as the parent. So what is a control then? So if a subsidiary is an entity that is controlled by another entity known as the subsidiary, then what is control? The word control can mean that the power to govern the financial and operating policies of an entity so as to obtain benefits from its activities. Let's say that again. Let's say that again. Control is defined as the power to govern the financial and operating policies of an entity so as to obtain benefits from its activities. So the power to govern, okay, the power to govern the financial and operating policies of an entity so as to obtain benefit is what we refer to as what? Control. Control. So the main question we ask ourselves is, you see, you, not all entities can prepare consolidated financial statements. You've got to be careful about this. Not enti all entities can prepare consolidated financial statements. So number one, an entity that is a subsidiary cannot prepare consolidated financial statements. An entity that is in itself a wholly owned subsidiary cannot prepare consolidated financial statements. I'm going to uh, come back to that in a moment. Number two, the entity has to be listed. Okay? So if the entity is listed, it can prepare a consolidated financial statement. Or, number three, the entity is preparing to be listed then it can prepare consolidated financial statements. So number one, an entity cannot prepare consolidated financial statement if it is in itself a wholly owned subsidiary. Number two, an entity cannot prepare consolidated financial statement if it is not listed or preparing to be listed on the stock exchange market in relation to that. So you've got to make sure that you understand that not all entities can prepare the consolidated financial statement. So, let's say that we have acquired a company. Can we consolidate the company? So, we can only consolidate their financial statements if we control them. Now, we've defined the word control as the power to govern the financial and operating activities or policies of another entity so we can obtain benefits from their activities. So how can an entity obtain control? How can an entity obtain control? There are various ways through which an entity can obtain control. In other words, there are various ways through which a company can become our subsidiary and we are their parent. So what are some of the ways through which we can obtain control? Number one, direct acquisition of Direct acquisition of more than 50% of the voting rights of the company. VR for voting rights. Direct acquisition of more than 50% of the voting rights of the company. So what do we mean here? It means that if P, we are the shareholders of P, and we acquire Q, and we acquire 60% of them, boom. What it means is that we have gone directly, meaning that we bought 50% voting rights, 50% ownership in the company, automatically, we are their parents and they become our subsidiary. 
Another thing is obtaining more than 50% voting, voting rights through uh, agreements with other shareholders. Okay? Obtaining more than 50% of voting rights by agreement with other shareholders. What does that mean? This is the sweetest part. So with this one, this is what happens. Let's say we are P and uh, we have invested 30% in Q. Okay? Now, our investment in Q, which is just 30%, doesn't give us control because for us to get control, we must have more than 50% of the voting rights. So technically, our investment gives us what is called significant influence. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So we have significant influence from our investment. What we have is significant influence. It means that this is an associate. So we are supposed to treat Q as an associate. But this is what happens. Let's say that the rest of the 70% ownership in Q is by this. So let's say that um, maybe Gabriel owns 20% there. And then let's say that uh, who else? Zayi uh, uh, owns, let's say, 25%. Then let's say that mm, who else? KK owns 45%. 45% as well. So look at what is going on here. This gives us 70%, okay? So we own 30, and the rest of the 70% is owned by our shareholders. Then this is what we do. We go to the shareholders and tell them that, hey, Gabriel, you have only 20%. Um, Sai, you have only 25%. Kenke, you have also 25%. But you know, you guys... You might not be able to make better decisions so that you make better ending. Uh, uh, better ending, sorry. For that reason, transfer your voting rights to us so that we can manage your portfolio better, we can make better decisions so we can join forces and control this firm well so we do what it is we need to do to benefit everybody. So let's say that we speak to uh, Gabriel and 20%. And we speak to Sai, 25%. And we speak to uh, Kenke, also 25%. And for some reason, uh, Gabriel said, no, he's not interested. Sai said, mm, I'm not even interested in managing this firm on my own. So you can take it. Then Kenke also said, no. So this is what happens. We have 30% ownership. Sai gives us his voting right of 25%. So when we add the two up, we now have 55% of the voting rights. So that is the second thing. We can obtain control of an entity uh, by having what? Agreement or by agreement with the other shareholders or with the other investors in relation to that. So you see that our single investment is just an associate, but because of the agreement with the other shareholders, Sai giving us his 25% voting rights, we now treat the investment as what? A subsidiary, and we gain control of them. So that is another way we can obtain control. Control too can be obtained by statute. Okay? This is by law. This is by law. Now, what do we mean by law? When we say by law, So by law. Now, if it is by law, what does it mean? This is, this is my 
Australia's fault to, for us to gain control. Now, what does that mean? You see, by law, sometimes uh, in some countries, when a listed company acquires shares in an unlisted company, by virtue of the status that they have, law or regulatory authorities may require that they become automatically their subsidiary. So even though they have acquired less than 50% of the voting rights of the company, by law, they can get control. You get the idea? By law, they can get control in relation to that. So that is also another way we can obtain control legally. This is law supporting us, regulatory authorities supporting us. We are bigger than them, so if we invest in them, it is better we, re we guide them, it is better we regulate them. The number uh, four that I would add is how many majority uh, majority seats, okay, or voting rights on the board. We have majority seats or voting rights on the board, meaning we can sack whoever, we can remove board members or appoint board members in relation to that. It could be by agreement. For instance, if you go and say, hey, a venture a VC firm should come and invest in your company, they will tell you that, all right, you, how many board members do you have? Okay, so you say you have nine member board. Okay, you have nine member board. For us to invest in the company, mm, 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 we want to have five members on the board. Now, if maybe they have five members on the board, you have only four. By virtue of that, you become their subsidiary in relation to that. So these are some of the ways through which control can be obtained. Directly acquiring more than 50% of the voting rights, which is the traditional thing, or agreeing with their existing shareholders so they transfer their voting rights to us, we can obtain control with that. The law supporting us, we can obtain control with that. Or having majority seats or voting rights on the board, meaning that we have the ability to be able to appoint or remove board members as and when we so wish in relation to that. So these are some of the ways through which an entity can obtain control. Comment in the chat box, let me know. Comment in the comment box, let me know if you have any questions for me real quick about what we've discussed so far. What we've discussed so far. So Adolfo said, your video is the hottest now in Liberia for the ICAG in Liberia. Oh, really? That is great to hear, Adolfo. Artists, right? We thank God. Continue, you guys. I know what you guys are doing for me there. So continue for us. Thank you very much. Listening live and clear. God bless you. God bless you as well, Boss Philip. Um, Said said, loving your method of teaching, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Sherry uh, Roy said, hi, hello, Sherry. Uh, if I mention your name wrong, forgive me, okay, Sherry. Okay. Um, Senior Kewawa, this is my first time. Okay, Senior Kewawa, you are welcome. I hope that you're loving it. Ruth said, hi, I have been following your videos. Continue with your good works. Much love from Zambia. Oh, another great country that I love so much, Zambia. Much love for you guys as well, Ruth. Um, Gabriel said, just shared with my friends in a WhatsApp group. Thank you very much, Gabriel. That is awesome. Uh, Bacho Fauza said, super delivery. Thank you very much. Uh, Ayanda said, highly appreciated from South Africa. Okay. Great. Bless up, South Africa. Uh, Samad, get high. Uh, Ayanda from India. Okay. Albert uh giving us an emoji um nicole williams said understand everything so far all right nicole i hope you're doing well all the way from jamaica okay so let's go so now that we've looked at the terminologies we've looked at how we can obtain control let's get into the real deal how do we consolidate so let's look at the steps involved in consolidation. The steps involved in consolidation. You ready? This is where we begin the journey. So you wanted to make sure you stay with me because I'm going to be dropping bombs throughout from now so that we can continue in relation to that. So there are five steps we're going to go through when preparing a consolidated financial statement. Five steps we're going to go through. Five. 
five. Number one, we establish the group structure. Number two, we determine the net assets of the subsidiary. Number three, we calculate any goodwill. Number four, we determine any non-controlling interest. And number five, we ascertain the group retained earnings. So number one, we determine the group structure. Number two, we're going to uh, determine the net assets of the subsidiary. Number three, we calculate any goodwill that we have available. Number four, any non-controlling interest that is if we have not acquired or the entity hadn't acquired 100% of the ownership of the firm, of the subsidiary, then the rest of the shareholding is referred to as non-controlling interest. And then number five, we're going to calculate any uh, issue in relation to uh, goodwill. Uh, did I say goodwill? Group retained earnings in that case. All right. So let's take these one after the other, and then let's drop some key ideas there. So establishing the group structure. So this is where we begin with the key principles. So make sure you stay with me very well here, okay? So let's go with the key principles. Number one, the group structure. Now, the group structure is very critical so that we can tell in the shareholding of the entity under consideration, okay? So we have, when it comes to the group structure, we have what we call the simple group and then the complex group structure. So we have the simple group structure and then the complex group structure. Now, for those of you writing financial reporting, the simple group structure is what we expect you to know. But those of you doing corporate reporting, that is where the complex group structure is going to come in. I'm going to share my thoughts on each, the two, so make sure that you pick where you are at, and then you understand the principle very well there. So under a simple growth structure, it is where a parent probably acquires a subsidiary. So let's say that a parent acquires about 75% uh, of the subsidiary. So if they don't own 100% of the subsidiary, that means that the rest of the 25% is referred to as what? The non-controlling interest then sometimes the entity may have interest in another company and the interest is maybe somewhere around 30%. And that will be treated as what? An associate. So this is what we call the simple group structure. A parent having one subsidiary like that and then probably having an associate in which it has 30%. Note that with a 75%, we have control so we can undertake a full consolidation on their financial statement. But with the entity that we have 30%, we don't have control. Instead, what we have is significant influence. So we're gonna be accounting for that in accordance with IAS 28, investment in associate and joint venture arrangement about that using the equity method. Don't worry, I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, all right? I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. Now, to the corporate reporting students, you ready? We're gonna go for Complex group structure. With a complex group structure, now the fact that the name sounds complex doesn't mean it is complex. But you see, in reality, companies don't have one parent, one subsidiary like that. No, in reality, sometimes this is what happens. A company invests in another company, okay? And then the company they invest in also goes to acquire another company. So we have sub subsidiary. Now, this is where the bond is about to start. So get, make sure you get me where you are. So let me bring that illustration up real quick. Finlove acquired 60% share in Guillermo two years ago. A year later, Guillermo also acquired 60% of Shandaba. So look at the group structure here. Finlove is the parent company, and they acquired 60% of Guillermo. So, if they acquire 60% of Guillermo, it means that in Guillermo, the non-controlling interest is 40%. Now, stay with me carefully here, complex group structure, okay? Complex group structure. Then, Guillermo also went to acquire 60% of Shandaba. 60%. Now, this is where you got to be careful at. This is where you got to be careful at. Finland acquired 60% of Guillermo. 
It means non controlling interest in Guillermo is 40%. Now, Guillermo went ahead to acquire 60% in Shandaba. Don't be misled and go and say, oh, Ishira, NCI here is also 40%. If you do that, where do you go? It means you have wasted your soul. It is wrong. So, how do you calculate the non controlling interest in the sub subsidiary? So, Guillermo is a subsidiary. Shandaba is the sub subsidiary. So the question is, how do you calculate the non controlling interest in the sub subsidiary? This is where the key issue is. The way we calculate the non controlling interest in the sub subsidiary is to first calculate the controlling interest in the sub subsidiary. So how do we calculate the controlling interest? Now, stay with me carefully here. This is what is going on. We own a company that also owns a, com a company. So this is the rule. The principle is that for whatever investment our subsidiary makes in the sub-subsidiary, our share of the ownership we have in them is also in the sub-subsidiary. In other words, whatever investment Guillermo makes, we own 60% of that investment. So in order for us to get our controlling interest in Shandaba, it is going to be our ownership in Guillermo multiplied by the investment Guillermo made in Shandaba. Are you getting the picture? Our investment in Guillermo multiplied by the investment made in Shandaba. Because whatever investment the subsidiary makes, in the sub-subsidiary, the parent entity has its share of ownership in that particular investment. I get in the picture in that particular investment. So what do we have? 60 by 60. So you can punch this 60 times 60 divided by 100, and that's 36%. So our interest in that is 36%. 36%. So remember that they are whole business is hundred percent. So the non-controlling interest initially it was called minority interest, but now it is not controlling interest. The non-controlling interest will be the balancing figure, and that's going to be sixty-four percent. Now stay with me carefully here. Stay with me carefully here. We said that we gain control when we own more than fifty percent. Don't be misled that our interest in the sub subsidiary is only 36%. It means we don't control them. It means we can't consolidate them. No, we can consolidate them. Why can we consolidate them? We can consolidate them because we control the company that controls them. Does it make sense? So our interest that is in Shandaba, it's only... 36%, but the non-controlling interest in Shandaba is 64%. But the fact that our interest in Shandaba is only 36% does not mean we don't have control, does not mean they are not our subsidiary. They are our subsidiary. Why? Because we control Guillermo and Guillermo controls them. That is what you got to understand when it comes to the complex group structure. So when you read a question and you find out that this is what is going on, the first thing you do is, okay, what is the parent interest in the sub-subsidiary? And that is how you go about it. Whatever investment the parent has in the subsidiary, it's the percentage of the investment of the subsidiary in the sub-subsidiary. That is what you need to understand in relation to that. I see a comment coming in from Ruth. Now, let me know if you, if you have any questions real quick as we continue. Mary O said, is this lecture for ACCA exams, FR techniques? Yes, definitely. Uh, Carlos Robert said, one month to go for me. Yeah, definitely one month to go. I hope you are learning. Ruth said, Sir, can we come again on the subsidiary and sub-subsidiary accounting treatment in the parent's company? All right. So what we're saying here is that 
Yes, Finland owned Guillermo, so definitely Guillermo is the subsidiary here. And then, so we own 60% of Guillermo, so the non-controlling interest is 40%, all right? Then Guillermo also owns Shandaba, 60%. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, what is the NCI in Shandaba? And that was what I was saying that the NCI in Shandaba is not 40%. If you do that, you were wrong. That is not correct. So in order for us to calculate the um, NCI in Shandaba, we need to calculate the controlling interest that the parent has in the sub-subsidiary, okay? Or in the entity that our subsidiary controls. So if we want to calculate the interest that we have, it is the share of our investment multiplied by whatever investment they have made. So we own 60%, and whatever investment they make, it means we have 60% share in that investment. So how much ownership do we have in Shandaba? Controlling interest. It will be our investment in Guillermo, 60%, multiplied by Guillermo's investment in Shandaba. It means we take 60% of that investment because we own 60% of the company. I hope you are getting the idea. We take 60% of the investment because we own 60% of the company. Hence, once we get that, you will get 36% uh, percent in relation to that, but the whole company is 100, so it means non-controlling interest in Shandaba is going to be what? 64%. And I'm saying that, don't be misled that it is just 36%. It means we cannot do full consolidation. No, we can do full con consolidation. Why? Because we control Guillermo and Guillermo controls them. So we will do full consolidation for Shandaba as well in relation to that. So Ruth, let me know if you understand the idea now. Let me know if you understand now. And then if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box, in the comment box. I'm reading all of the comments live. And uh, consider to give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. That way we get more engagement on the video. YouTube and Facebook will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible. If you are having value in the video, Come on, smash the like button. That way we can reach a lot of people. So together we can uh, touch a lot of people's life in that case. All right. So Ruth, I see a comment from Ruth saying that uh, it is clear. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So I see a comment from Ruth saying it's clear. Okay. That's awesome. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Okay, now so let me give you another illustration still on the growth structure stuff, stuff, okay? Now, one thing on the growth structure thing is that once you put up the group structure, you have to understand three things, usually three things. Number one, date of acquisition. Very, very important. Number two, the reporting date. Then number three, the post-acquisition period. Okay? So when drawing or sketching, if I want to, or putting down your group structure, three things. So after you sketch whatever story you got from the question, you've got to make sure that you write in the date of acquisition, the reporting date, and then the post-acquisition period. The difference between the date of acquisition and the reporting date gives you the post-acquisition period. Now, note that the post-acquisition period could be whatever. It could be a full-year acquisition. It could be a six-month media acquisition. Or it could be a three-month acquisition. Why is that important? That is very important so that if you are preparing the consolidated profit or loss or other, and other comprehensive income. Let me take that again. The reason you need this is so that if you are preparing a consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, that means that the subsidiary, you would have to take only X over 12 of their 
financial statement results from the PNL account. So if you have if the post acquisition period is three months, then they are then you you take three over twelve. They are cost of sales, you take three over twelve. They are tax, you take three over twelve. Whatever thing that is in their PNL account, you will take three over twelve. So you need to understand the post acquisition period when preparing the consolidated profit or loss account. Not only that, if you are preparing the consolidated statement of financial position, knowing the post acquisition period also helps us to deal with fair value adjustments, depreciation, to deal with intra-group trading uh, provision for realized profit, to deal with issues in relation to share of post acquisition profit or loss. So it is very, very important. So if you miss the post acquisition period, you're gonna screw yourself up very much. So that is the idea about the group structure. That is the idea about the group structure. Now, in the group, like I said, sometimes we may have associates coming into the picture. So if we have associates coming into the picture, the question we ask ourselves is, how do we deal with it? How do we look at it in relation to that? I told you already about associates. Anytime an entity owns uh, more than 25% of, an, of another entity, but less than 50%, it cannot consolidate that entity. Rather, it must treat the investment as what? Well, associate. So when it comes to investment in associate, investment in associate is accounted for in accordance with IAS 28. Investment in associates is accounted for in accordance with IAS 28, investment in associates and joint venture arrangements. Now, according to IAS 28, investment in associates should be accounted for using the equity method. Using the equity method. Please note that joint venture arrangements also are accounted for using the equity method. Okay, so that is going to be applying through in relation to that. So if we are using the equity accounting or the equity method for the investment in associate, what are some of the things we're going to be looking at? So let's pull our pro forma up here. We're going in a million dollars. So we bring the cost of the investment. This is how much the uh, parents, supposed parent entity paid for the percentage they acquired in the other entity that we brought here. Then we're going to have definitely the issue in relation to post acquisition period, post acquisition profit or loss. If they made a profit, uh -oh, we're going to add loss is going to be deducted. Okay, we bring that up. Then in payment in investment and associates, listen to this carefully. Not in payment in goodwill. Not in payment in our subsidiary. No, in payment in the investment in the subsidiary, uh, in the associate. If the associate, for some reason, during the year, they uh, make a decision or do something that affects us, then there will be impairment. So impairment in investment in associate will be brought here, and that reduces our, the value of our investment. So we're going to deduct that. Now, stay with me, Kathy. We bring share of profit or loss, but on top of that, we're going to be bringing any dividend that we receive. So during the year, if the associate declared the dividend, we are going to be having our percentage of ownership of that dividend. So for instance, if we own 10% of the company and they pay a dividend of $20 million, then definitely, definitely we're going to have 30% of that $20 million. Whatever dividend we receive, has to be deducted. Stay with me carefully. Whatever dividend that is received has to be deducted. Let me state here carefully that if you are preparing the consolidated profit or loss and other comprehensive income, in the consolidated profit or loss and other comprehensive income, dividend received doesn't appear there. It is rather our post-acquisition share of profit or loss. Let me take that again. In the preparation of the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, dividend received doesn't appear there. Instead, it is the post-acquisition share of profit or loss. 
Listen to that carefully. Because sometimes the examiner can set a trap for you and will tell you that included in the parent investment income is their share of investment of $5 million from the received from the associate. $5 million. They have included it there. So what do you do? You have to take it out because dividend received is not recorded in PL. Dividend, it is rather than a share of profit that is recorded in the PL. So please make sure you get that principle very, very well. You good? Right. So cost of our investment, boom. Share of profit and loss, boom. Impairment, deducted. Dividend, deducted. Then Provision for unrealized profits will be deducted. Now, I want you to stay with me carefully on this one. Provision for unrealized profit. I want you to stay with me carefully on this one. Now, sometimes the parent sells to the subsidiary. If the parent sells to the... No. If the parent sells to the associate, and at the end of the year, for some reason... The associate hasn't finished selling all. The P2P calculation between parents and associates is different from the calculation between parents and subsidiary. So here, what is going to be happening is that whatever PUP balance that we got, we will take only our share of ownership as the provision for realized profits. Let's take that again. When the parent sells to the sub, to the associate, and at the end of the year, uh, uh, at the end of the year, what happens is that they are not able to sell everything. Then definitely the profit hasn't been earned. For that reason, provision for realized profit will be calculated. But what will be coming here is the percentage of our ownership of the associate. Okay, of our ownership of the associate. Uh, later on, we'll be looking at some questions, uh, and then. If some of these things pop up, we'll be able to talk about it in relation to that. But not everything you can really get, the more you expose yourself to questions, the more you get some of these items in that case. So uh, I think that should be all, probably. So this will be the investment in associate value. That will go to the consolidated statement of financial position. Okay, so when we go to the consolidated statement of financial position, this is the figure we're going to be recording there in relation to the investment in associates. You got it? So that is principle number one, the group structure. The group structure. Any questions, please? Any questions? Any questions, please? Put it in the comment box if you have any questions. Sherry said, uh, Sherry said, thank you so much. I appreciate this a lot. Okay. Sherry again said, I'm in Jamaica and I'm using your video to help with auditing and advanced financial reporting. I'm in fourth year. This is like a godsend. Oh, that is great to hear, Sherry. Wishing you all the best in your final exams as you graduate from college. Um... Larry Benjamin said, oh, I'm late. Yeah, you can watch the playback later on. Akta Kwame, yep, you are welcome to the stream. Hello, how are you doing? Any questions for me? Put it in the comment box for me real quick. Now, remember that uh, from next week, Monday, we are starting with our Executive Revision Masterclass for the ICA November 2020 examination. And uh, it's going to be intense, it's going to be involving, it's going to be a lot of work. So if it is something that you are interested in that you would want to join us and study directly under my membership, it is 325 Ghana cities per paper, and this gives you access to our lecture videos, this gives you access to uh, our course materials, this gives you access to join our Zoom sessions and get a one-on-one -on -one session with me, personalized sessions with me, so I can assist you in order for you to prepare well for your examination. So even if this is something that is cut out for you, you want to really get that personalized uh, and be able to prepare adequately for the exams, you can call 050-114-9296, 050-114-9296, and you will be able to uh, get a direction on that. 
and then register and be able to join us for the executive revision masterclass. Kwame Atta said, can you explain dividend received? Yeah, I think I explained that. I said, if the associate pays any dividend during the year and we receive the dividend, it has to be deducted in the determination of the current amount of our investment in associates. Why do we do that? Because we bring the share of profit that was added. It is out of profit that dividend is paid. So if we added at the profit, then whatever dividend we receive has to be deducted. But I was also saying that if the dividend received has already been included in the parent statement of profit or loss, then we have to take it from there because the dividend received does not is not what appears in the PL account. Instead, it is the share, post acquisition share of profit or loss that appears there. So if they have included it there, we take it out and instead we take our share of post acquisition profit there in that case. So at that point, that is the idea about dividend received. Any other questions for me, please? Any other questions for me? So rule number one, determine your group structure. In the determination of your group structure, what do you do? It depends on where you are standing. If you're a level two student, it's gonna be a simple group structure. You can run away and go away with that. But if you're a level three student, corporate reporting or advanced financial reporting or SBR, you're gonna have a parent, a sub, and then probably a sub subsidiary. But most importantly, you should be able to compute the controlling interest of the parent in the sub subsidiary and then the NCI included in the sub subsidiary. However, on your group structure, you've got to make sure that there are three things there the date of acquisition, the reporting date, so that you can also get the post acquisition period in relation to that. Then, aside in the group structure, sometimes there could be uh, an associate. So accounting for associates, we said that we use uh, IS28 investment in associate and joint venture arrangements using the equity accounting method to account for it in our books in relation to that. And that is the pro forma per IAS28 in that case. Um, Adolfo said, um, can you please have a video of ratio and publish account? If it's a ratios, I've already done a two-part video on the ratios. You can check the channel and you'll be able to see uh, it on the channel. I did a two-part lectures on ratios, I think uh, about two months ago, something like that. And that is already available on the channel. So you can check it out. I think when you go to single entity financial statement, there is a playlist there, single entity financial statement on the channel, you'll be able to get it all. Uh, financial reporting, sorry, accounting standard series. These two playlists, one of them should have that two-part video. So I've done a two-part video already on ratios, evaluation of financial statements. So you can check it out uh, on the channel in that case. Any other questions, please put it in the chat for me. Any other questions, put it in the chat for me. Right, so that is basically our first principle, the group structure, the group structure. Now, the second principle is to talk about the issue in relation to uh, the net assets, the net assets of the subsidiary. So why, why is that important? Because once we have determined that this is our subsidiary, then we need to determine what their net assets and find out what is going on there. It is from there that we'll be able to calculate the goodwill and we'll be able to do the various computation in relation to that. But... Because of time constraints, I'm going to conclude around here today so that tomorrow, God willing, we're going to be continuing with a part two of consolidated financial statement and continue with the principles on that. So you want to make sure that you catch me again, same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. GMT uh, on the live stream as we continue with, the, the, with this discussion. So tomorrow, I'm going to touch on the group. Uh, the net asset, that is one of the technical areas. I'll deal with the fair value adjustment. When the examiner said it's in excess, what do you do? It's in below, what do you do? Additional depreciation, prior period adjustment, all of those things, we'll be touching on them, God willing, tomorrow as we continue with our discussion. So 
I'm going to conclude around here today. And thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way. And I will uh, come your way again tomorrow as we continue with our discussion. Uh, Adolphus said, thank you. Always a pleasure. Nicole Williams said, well received, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure. So thank you very much. Continue to uh, share the video. Continue to share the channel with your friends, your colleagues, across everywhere they are. Once you are having value and you know there are people who must have value like this, we have over 450 videos already on the channel. So 9 out of 10 of everything you are looking for, it's already covered on the channel. Check it out and join me every day on the live stream, Monday to Friday exclusively on the live stream, 4.30 p.m. GMT, as I answer your questions live and also teach you on something to assist you to prepare well for your examination. So thank you very much. See you same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. GMT, as we continue with our discussion. So we meet again tomorrow. Stay blessed and stay safe.